everybody, welcome back to Psychedelic Say Solidarity Fridays. Joe Moore here, joined by a whole mess of folks. I'm really excited about today, and um, <laughs> we'll see um, what we can get into. Before we kick it off, um, I want to remind everybody that we have a new course coming up on July 22nd, um, Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists. and I'm really excited about it. We've got, what, 47 hours of class material, 12 hours of CE. Um, you don't need to be a clinician to come in, even though we say that. It's, um, that's just where we're speaking to. We're speaking at a clinical level, and um, I promise it's going to be a good time for you. We've got so many great testimonies you can read on our website, um, psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And um, yeah, we'll be running this again in September. But if you want to jump in now, please do. We'd love to have you. And um, there's time slots available for folks in the U.S., Canada, um, Europe, Britain, and Australia. So come on down. No real reason not to do it. If you want to figure out where you're going in the space, come on down. Um, again, psychedelicstoday.com or psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Um, cool. So today on the show, Michelle Janikian, Kyle Buller, David Drapkin, and Manesh Gurn. Um, the psychedelic scientist. Did I say your name right? I'm sorry. Yeah, I heard the hesitation. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, yeah, Manesh yeah. Gurren. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. And um, you've got a YouTube channel. Um, is it the psychedelic scientist? Is that it? Yes, that's it. Yes. Cool. Yeah, you've got a lot of really great material there. Um, and uh, this is not your first time on the show, right? We've um, got a podcast with you a few weeks back or recorded it a few weeks back. It hasn't yeah, been totally. released yet for a listener. So yeah, I would say keep an ear ah. out soon for Manesh's personal episode. I think it's cool. coming out next month. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Cool. So um really excited to have you here today because um the others of us here aren't exactly neuroscientists. Um, and there was a really great article last week that we talked about um, the psilocybin proving neurogenesis article. It was at cell.com. I don't actually know what journal that was. Anybody help me out on that one? It was in Neuron, which is yeah. actually one of the top Neuron. tier uh, neuroscience journals. It's like the, if you think of science as like the top place for any science, Neuron is the science of neuroscience. If that makes sense. Oh. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Really niche, like top in that category. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I don't know, like this, the article was cool. One of the things I got hung up on was like, do we know that neurogenesis correlates to negative or sorry, positive psychological benefits? Um, you know, do, do we know that or what, what do we know about neurogenesis and what do you think of that article in general? Did you have any kind of impressions yeah. that you want to share? Yeah, for sure. I mean, to answer your question, like, uh, and they kind of mentioned this in the article too, uh, a very common thing they find in depressed patients is reduced neuroplasticity, right? Uh, alongside atrophy in particular parts of the brain, particularly frontal cortex, it just seems there is a dysregulation of activity that makes it in, in essence more rigid and less amenable to be changed, uh, which is neuroplasticity. And so, um, but and also in rat studies, actually, but previously, you can inject them with something like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So something that increases neuroplasticity, you could just straight up inject this into a mouse brain and you see that um, if, they were, if they had behaviors resembling depression before that, they actually get better. So we know that mm -hmm. it seems to be the case that neuroplasticity alone, um, particularly in the frontal cortex, seems to relieve uh, depressive symptoms, right? And, and so in this study... Um, again, done in, done in rats, not in humans. There's been no neuroplasticity study such as this done in humans, uh, like alive waking humans. Um, they particularly looked at the medial prefrontal cortex and found all these uh, aspects of neuroplasticity in terms of uh, what are called dendritic spines. And if you want, I could describe what those are. Um, could you please, Manesh? But, but, <laughs> sure, I could just, yeah. Okay, okay, for sure, for sure. So, okay, so... Let's start with what is a neuron? So a neuron is a brain cell. And you could say there's three primary components of a neuron, right? There is the cell body or the soma, which is like the middle part of it. And then there's the axon, which is this long protrusion that comes out of it. And basically a neuron cells uh, sends nerve impulses or electrical activity, you could say, down the axon. 
And then at the end of the axon, it attaches onto the dendrite. Well, it doesn't attach, but it comes very close to the dendrite of another neuron. So a dendrite is the receiving station, right? Thank you and, so much. And dendrite is from the Greek dendron, which means tree, because it looks like a big tree. It kind of branches out, and we talk about dendritic arborization. Basically talk as if it's a bunch of branches in a tree. And so, so the dendrite is a receiving station, and on the dendrite, and the specific places where the axon of another neuron connects are dendritic spines. So within the dendrite, there's little protrusions, little kind of circular protrusions um, that are called spines, which mediate, which directly mediate the connection with an axon. And, and so mm -hmm. in this study, they found um, they were particularly interested in the spines in dendrites of, particular, of a particular type of uh, neuron called the pyramidal cell. Uh, and frontal cortex, which are known to have very high density of serotonin 2A receptor, uh, receptors, so the receptor that psychedelics hit. And so, and so they're interested, does the 2A, does activating the serotonin 2A receptor on this brain cell, on this type of brain cell, um, change plasticity in terms of the spines on the dendrites? As in, does it basically create more possibilities for connections with other axons? Um, and they found, mm. yes, it actually, you know, made, uh, made there be more spines. So the spine density was increased. And also the width of a given spine was also increased and it protruded even more. So in uh, these multiple metrics of dendrite size and, um, and density uh, were increased by up to 10% uh, within 24 hours. And something like a third of these were even lasting after, after a month. And, um, and it is a pretty huge, you know, thing from taking a, a single dose or and they did, did dose a few times, but a limited number of doses of psilocybin to get this kind of dramatic effect a month later. And it goes mm. in to speak back to the depression thing. It's suggested for depression because, you know, people have less of that when they're depressed and mice do as well. Mm -hmm. You know, for, right on. I so a, okay, oh. it's not evidence, right? It's kind of like a little suggestive as you're saying. Sorry, Michelle, go ahead. I just have a question, um, Manesh, like, are there other medications or experiences that we know do a similar thing? Yeah, well, ketamine is a great example. So right. um, ketamine is known to do this exact same thing, basically, of increasing um, neuroplasticity in terms of spine density uh, and size and these same very similar markers. So basically, they were basically mimicking a, a paradigm that is used to study ketamine for psilocybin, essentially, and found similar results. Um, yeah, I think so I that's have come a notable up. one. And, uh, we know that neuroplasticity. Oh, please continue. Sorry, Don't Michelle. listen to me. <laughs> no, I was just going to say we know neuroplasticity is increased by um, by running, by exercise, uh, aerobic exercise, and a variety of other things as well. Although the mechanisms are likely different in these cases because there is some nuance to it, but it does seem these like these uh, pharmacal pharmacological interventions, if you will, or drugs which boost neuroplasticity. Um, often seem to relate to spine density, et cetera, and dendrite, dendritic spines. Thank you. Yeah, I had a similar question managed, just following on from Michelle. I occasionally take some uh, functional mushroom, you know, vitamin tablets and things like that. So lion's mane, reishi. So uh, do functional mushrooms and nootropics have a similar effect on the brain? Is it through that same kind of dendritic spine um, mechanism? Very likely. I'm not entirely sure. And I think there's a, there's a limited amount of research on a lot of those adaptogens. We're, 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 there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and people suggesting it and maybe one study here and there that showed something. Um, but it is like there is not that much research in the area. And I'm not totally familiar with lion's mane, et cetera, and, how they, and the research that's out there. But I would imagine it's similarly related to uh, something going on in, well, in the synapse, which is where all neuroplasticity would happen. Uh, and that would likely relate to the dendritic, the so-called uh, postsynaptic side, uh, and then the ability to receive an additional amount of connections. Hmm. Yeah, and maybe another question, that's okay. You're, you're talking about the dendrites basically being a minuscule tree inside of our brain, and we've got billions of them. Um, we were talking last week about uh, psilocybin, sounded like it's a fertilizer for the brain in a sense, and it, it's literally like, you're growing it from the root and you were saying, and then it goes down the axon and then out through the dendrites. And there was a, a concept in the article where it said um, that the psilocybin um, has elevated excitatory neurotransmission. So I was particularly interested 
to get your opinion or just to understand like what does that mean when it's saying what's elevated excitatory neurotransmission yeah totally that's a really good question because uh okay well another common thing between uh, ketamine and psilocybin is that at the end of the day they both act on what's called the glutamate system in the brain so ketamine does this directly it modulates glutamate activity but actually, serotonin 2A receptor activation has the net result of increasing glutamate activity in the brain as well. And what glutamate is, it's the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, which means that it mediates most of the brain's activity. Like it makes neurons more likely to fire. That's what means, that's what excitatory means. It makes uh, neurons more likely to fire. And um, in the context of depression, for example, um, in mice models and in humans, uh, to some degree, there is a reduction in glutamate uh, activity in the frontal cortex. So there seems to be a l less of ability to activate in the normal way, which again is probably related to a reduced number of synapses, reduced number of neurons uh, due to atrophy and other you know, issues that happen in depression and as a result of chronic stress, which often hand is hand in hand with, with depression. And so in this study, they're showing that not only did it increase these dendritic spines and make the possibility for more connections, um, they also found evidence with, that's consistent with the idea that these new connections were being used to create more activity than is usually present in, the, in that area. So when you say increase excitatory neurotransmission, it just means there's more activity going on, whereas before they probably had reduced you know, activity relative to, to healthy, healthy mice. So it's kind of renormalizing the amount of activity in frontal cortex. That's kind of what they're getting at. Brilliant. So I'm a therapist, by the way. So often when, when I'm working with clients, I'll talk about behavioral activation strategies, things like you were saying, you know, going to the gym or developing hobbies, having kind of good um, lifestyle uh, rituals and routines. And so the way you were just explaining it there is that excitatory neurotransmission kind of gives a bit more uh, likelihood of following through motivation to make behavioral change. And in the article, actually, let's see what it said. It said, psilocybin ameliorates stress-related behavioral deficit in mice. And then it also used the term learned helplessness. So when we're looking at depression, the way you were just des describing that uh, elevated excitatory neurotransmission, it sounds like that's kind of part of that relationship there. I don't know if you could you help to tie it all together in a way. Yeah, totally. So the learned helplessness, this is interesting. So, I mean, when we're studying mental disorders in mice, we have to find a way to index those disorders in the mice, right? We can't ask them, like, are you ruminating on your life right now or something like this, <laughs> right? Uh, so we need to find uh, indirect ways to measure it. And so one of the ways to do it, and it's kind of terrible, it's like, and well, what they did in this study was they put them in a box, let's say, and the floor um, shocks them. So the thing is, they're in, they're in this confined box that they can't escape from, and you're just, they're just getting repeatedly shocked. And at some point, they're like, oh, forget it. I just give up. Like, what's the point? I'm just going to get shocked. I can't do anything about it. And then later, they mm -hmm. put them into another box where now they can escape and they're getting shocked. And But some mice were like, no, screw it. I don't care anymore. I'm just going to get shocked. Even though, even though they can escape, they're not even trying to escape. And that's called learned helplessness. And that's like an animal model of stress um, and depression to some extent as well. And so in this study, they, they wanted to see if, if, if you give them psilocybin, if you first train them to like, uh, you know, not be able to escape and get shocked and then give them psilocybin and put them back in there, how likely are they to try to escape? And they found there was like, they did uh, successfully es escape more uh, after receiving psilocybin. And this is a common awesome. thing because uh, common antidepressants, SSRIs do this as well. Uh, they reduce learned helplessness in this animal model. And, and, so, and so they found, yeah, like, you know, that psilocybin also did this. Although I didn't see them correlate the neuroplastic changes directly to that, but they, they coincided with each other. That, um, you know, there's increased neuroplasticity, their frontal cortex is a bit more active, and they're less likely to give in to this learned helplessness. Amazing. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's okay to ask one more question perhaps, but it also makes me think about um, intergenerational trauma. Mm. And I recently had a, a chat with someone, um, Sam Clark of Terran Biosciences, and he, he explained a term to me that I loosely understood called methylation of, of our DNA. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if you know much about methylation, but um, it, I'm wondering if, if that, like how does psilocybin in this neurogenesis, neuroplasticity mm -hmm. affect the kind of DNA latent kind of yeah. within us around intergenerational trauma, because the way you were just describing that, you know, that increased ability to, um, 
transform our life and be more motivated to to uh, you know uh, get out of that box that we're currently being shocked by mm-hmm. i think we experience life as traumatic and we inherit trauma from uh, you know our ancestors so is there a sense of the methylation or the dna that you you, you feel comfortable talking about here yeah uh, in for, relation to this for sure how can uh, my understanding at least uh, of what you're talking about is that methylation can correspond to epigenetic changes right and that's what are presumably passed down in, in terms of inter- intergenerational trauma you just born with a different expression of a given gene. And, um, and it is the case that actually psychedelics have been shown in mice and, and ketamine to increase gene expression of uh, genes associated with neuroplasticity. So it can be very well the case if you have this you know, intergenerational trauma and you have a, you're really sensitive to stress and um, this can later, later lead to reduced neuroplasticity, that um, psilocybin has the potential to turn the genes back on for neuroplasticity and undo uh, to some extent that negative epigenetic programming so i think that that totally is consistent with what what we've seen beautiful thanks so much manish Mm -hmm. yeah that was great to have that broken down by an expert really appreciate it (laughs) my pleasure Mm. i wonder too talking about like neuroplasticity if we found drugs or substances that um, increase neuroplasticity and just in terms of psilocybin like how much do you think the benefit comes from the experience as well. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious about that. Like <clears throat> the increased neuroplasticity is obviously probably beneficial, but also the new maybe novel ideas or the the experience that you undergo with with psilocybin. I mean, I guess we have no idea really what mice experience under that. But um, yeah, yeah, it's it's re- it's a really interesting interesting question and pertinent, especially a lot of people discussing. You know, is the psychedelic experience necessary? Uh, and we talked about that last time I was on um, chatting with you guys. And I think there's two components to it. In, in some sense, it does seem like neuroplasticity alone uh, just helps people with their depressive symptoms, potentially more in the short term. And again, you know, there's studies where they're injecting BDNF in mice and they're not necessarily, it's not psychoactive, but they're getting improvements uh, in this animal model of depression. But I think in humans, like the best, how I think about it is that the neuroplasticity just gives your brain more resources to encode the insights and the experiences that you go through. Um, mm. And so you have this radical experience where you might have insight into your patterns, into your traumas, et cetera. But then in order to last in a lasting way in your brain, you need some degree of neuroplasticity. And it's kind of giving you the push there. And so I think they both synergize with each other. I think if you have this boost in neuroplasticity, you can really exploit and leverage it with conscious intention. Um, but I think if you don't have the conscious intention, you might still get some benefit. It just won't last as long. That's kind of how I see it. But they really do need more research in humans and actually looking at how these things correlate, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Anything else on this one before we jump over to Mr. Pollen? Actually, there's one more thing actually from this uh, paper that we should mention because they actually tried giving uh, a drug called Contanserin which is a serotonin two-way receptor antagonist. So it blocks the two-way receptor. And as we know, the two-way receptor is the one, you know, responsible for psychedelic effects, et cetera. If you block this receptor with cancerin in humans, you don't, you don't trip. You could take as much psilocybin or LSD as you want, but you're not going to have an experience. And so uh, they wanted to see, is the neuroplastic benefit still there if you block uh, this receptor? And they found, interestingly, that it was, uh, it was reduced to some extent, but it was still there. Um, mm-hmm. And they kind of uh, say, but there's some caveats there, but they kind of like use that as a, to support the idea that trip might, might, might not be necessary. But they also mentioned the very important fact that in humans, uh, sorry, in mice, catanserin only blocks around 30% of serotonin 2A receptors. So that leaves, mm-hmm. you know, the vast majority is still there. Mm-hmm. And so like very, it's very likely because we know the serotonin, serotonin uh, 2A receptor mediates neuroplastic changes that those remaining 70% were um, we're responsible for that. And therefore we can't like, you know, say that we totally blocked it. And, uh, and so, and, and I think the reason why they carried that finding with a bit more weight is because it reduced, um, head, head twitching in the mice. And so, yeah, I should mention what that means. It's kind of funny cause it's, we don't know if a, if a mouse or a rat is tripping. So what scientists have found reliably that when you give them a serotonin to a agonist drug, you know, psilocybin, LSD, DOI, uh, 5-MeO, you know, et cetera, um, they twitch their heads a lot. And it's called the head <laughs> twitch response. So they measure how much they twitch their head, and that's an index of how much they're having a psychedelic experience. 
And so they found that, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of <laughs> funny when you think of the profound, you know, depth and diversity of the psychedelic experience to head twitching. But, um, <laughs> but they found that <laughs> Katantarin, even though it blocked only 30%, it did significantly attenuate the head twitching. So they're like, oh, these mice aren't tripping and we're still getting the neuroplastic without the tripping. But again, we have no idea whether this generalizes up to humans at all and what it really says that we can have the, uh, you know, the effects without the trip. But yeah, but I thought that was an important thing to note about the article too. Definitely. Thank you for that. I had no idea. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for pointing that out. For sure. Mm. All right. Um, glad we understand that a little better now. Good stuff. Um, all right. So next up is... Our, our friend Michael Pollan published an article on New York Times, and um, Michelle, I was wondering if you might be able to give us kind of a, a little bit of an introduction into what Michael Pollan did there. Yeah, well, this is clearly, you know, um, to promote his new book. He, Michael Pollan just had a book come out like a week ago called This Is Your Brain on Drugs. I have a copy somewhere, something like that. Um, and... Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, this is his opinion on, you know, how should we do drugs now? And um, he's basically arguing, you know, that the like a Western culture needs some kind of ritual or something to ground them. And if we're talking about psychedelics and, uh, you know, he has a lot of strong opinions in here that are, you know, questionable, like you need a doctor or sober trip sitter to do this work, which I'm very um, vocal about how I'm not really sure if that's true, but I mean, I don't really, I don't know. Is he talking about intentional use think? in like a ceremonial setting or like what we do at cocktail parties? Well, that's the thing. I think that that could be included, but I think he's talking more about he, he has the medical model and the indigenous religious use model as his two examples, which... I just kind of feel like if we are really talking about how we do drugs now, we should be talking to psychonauts who have been doing these drugs for like decades and who do have rituals that That's are a, such not a false dichotomy. part of this dichotomy. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, like Michael Pollan in his in uh, How to Change Your Mind was pretty, pretty vocal that he had a lot of recreational cocaine experience and like to shame the other categories now seems a little weird to me. I don't know. Like we need to be talking about all of them, not just a couple use cases because the majority of drug use exists outside of those two containers. Yeah. I mean, he's um, in my opinion, I agree. I think, you know, he's really speaking to a specific audience, right? And this is what makes that audience comfortable, which is kind of why I'm not the, just the biggest fan of it, but like, you know, he's speaking to this very kind of conservative yet liberal, like upper middle class white people who read the New York Times and like trying to make them comfortable with this idea of psychedelics and and ending the drug war. And this is his, you know, way of doing so. Um, but yeah, I just I just don't quite agree. <laughs> <laughs> That you need a doctor in the mix um, or a sober trip. You know, obviously at that all. adds safety. Right. I was just watching the Groff documentary last night um, that Susan Hess Leger did that we did some screenings for. And there was one moment in there that said, you should never do this without a trip sitter. I'm like, huh? Fascinating. Um, I see how that keeps people safe. Uh, but I also see how it kind of limits like our imagination around these topics and what's possible. Um, yeah, like I get it. Like, of of course, we should try to stay safe when we can, but there's points at which people want to diverge from the safe path. I also like um, just think that a lot a little of little folks more experimental. are creating their own rituals, which do ground them, and they don't have to be like appropriations of indigenous culture or appropriations of the medical model. I think for most folks, they're kind of somewhere in the middle, and like. I know my rituals look nothing like either of those approaches. And I don't know. I just feel like this conversation is often just forgetting what real people in real time are doing, which is, you know, I think a lot of folks for especially with mushrooms for 
spiritual use and personal growth are using them totally by themselves and getting a lot of benefit. And I just, I don't know. I just feel like this is very pigeonholy on like how it should be. And, and it just doesn't actually make a lot of sense to me, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Anybody else? (laughs) Yeah, there were a couple of, um, quotes that I took out that, that I quite like because uh, you know, he's talking about moving the conversation along. So he's saying, quoting, while we can now begin to glimpse an end to the drug war, it's much harder to envision what the drug peace will look like. So just I, I quite like that term drug peace in a sense because there has been this drug war for so long. It's a little bit kitsch, yeah, drug peace. But what we're looking for is, is for there to be options um, and for people to... Uh, yeah, and f- probably um, each state will will ultimately develop slightly differently. And the article did say how states and towns within each state may well want to do things differently. Um, and then there was another quote. He said, "The conversation begins with the recognition that humans like to change consciousness, and that cultures have been using psychoactive plants and fungi to do so for as long as there have been cultures." And he uses the example of coffee. You know, we we drink coffee because we like how it makes us feel. And it's relatively safe. And then towards the end, he speaks more about alcohol and tobacco as being you know, these incredibly deadly um, drugs. And I, I was just reading an article just came out today. I think it was 470,000 people uh, in the last year developed cancer attributable to, to alcohol alone. Um, so he does speak about harm reduction and, and decriminalization. And he mentions the Portugal and Switzerland models um, that you know are, are pretty pioneering in this space. Um, and yeah, as Michelle was saying, it's nice that he, he does touch upon there being a spectrum and finding different options to suit different um, different people. But um, yeah, it's just, this is such a long process. It's it's a nice nice article and a nice book, but ultimately isn't he, it's good that he's lending his voice to, to, the, to the movement, um, but it's really important to have other voices as well. Um, that are going to be the builders of what actually happens on a policy and framework sense. I just want to add, I got the title of Michael There's Pollan's interesting... new book wrong. Oh, I'm so sorry, Kyle. Um, it's called This Is Your Mind on Plants. Just a correction. Please continue. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just a piece in here just about um, taking drugs for pleasure. Um, and I find that to be like a really interesting concept. Um, so his the, the um, sentence here, there... Uh, This is an uncomfortable territory, partly because few Americans regard pleasure as a legitimate reason to take drugs, and partly because the drug war, um, parentheses, with its supporters in academia and the media, uh, on parentheses, uh, has produced a dense fog around misinformation, especially around addiction. Um, And this is something I've been kind of chatting about recently, um, just in terms of, like, say, therapy. Um, And sometimes it's hard to bring that pleasure in, right? It's like always needing to focus on the bad. Um, and for healing, like, what does it feel like to bring pleasure into the healing experience? So just thinking about taking drugs for a pleasure that could be healing, you know, I've mentioned it on the podcast before and just doing this project, hearing people go to festivals or concerts and use these substances or use them in situations where there's more social bonding happening and doing it for that more pleasure like why is that a wrong wrong right and i'm just even thinking in terms of like therapy at times it's like oh if we're not digging into your biographical history or trauma then what are we doing here like can we bring pleasure into our human experience at times without feeling so guilty or some sort of shame around it. And I don't know, maybe it is based around, Oh, if I like this, I'm going to get addicted to it. Um, and that, that's bad. Or maybe if you indulge in pleasure too much, you become hedonistic and, and that's terrible for society as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know, just some thoughts, uh, skimming through that, that part as well. Yeah, I think there are a lot of currents in that, right? It's also just the the whole culture that we're embedded in where it's like you have to be a productive member of society, you have to achieve and pursue this and that. There's no time for this idle pleasure, right? It's like almost frowned upon on those grounds in addition to equating pleasure with, uh, you know, becoming dependent on it as if that instantly happens if you take something for pleasure. Um, and just like, you know, just I think uh, not giving people enough credit they deserve in order to manage themselves and just, you know, to have some fun, enjoy some pleasure and still be productive and still not get, you know, addicted, which is many, many people, of course. 
Um, and, and I think it's just like a fear of pe- people not being able to control themselves. Uh, that's kind of what it boils down to. And I think instead of, you know, denouncing it and, and saying it's a bad thing, just help them, tr- you know, uh, gain better self-control or regulation strategies and help educate people on that. Um, and also try to be, I guess, realistic on how people actually are taking them and what the outcomes typically are for a normal person who lives a balanced life, who wants to go enjoy some MDMA or something like this. And, and another mm-hmm. thing, I think even Michael Paul and like the whole thing, like have a doctor, have a tripper. I think these are kind of blanket statements he's applying to everybody, but really it's like, and that might apply to some people who are already at high risk if they're taking it. And there's a lot of people who can take it, you know, maybe by themselves or in a different context and be safe. But there's that, the, that proportion of the you know, population where it is very risky and they could put you in a dark place and you might not have the, the stable foundations in your life to take it and be safe. Um, but like, you can't just treat everybody like that and just assume everyone's the same and everyone's at the same risk potential, right? I think there's a lot of nuance not acknowledged a lot of the time. Hmm. Well said. Yeah, I wonder just in terms of like being a journalist or media and just thinking about like how we present, like, I guess like, yeah, having maybe that professional stance and needing to make these disclaimers at times, right? Like some sort of like social responsibility. So it doesn't come off as saying, hey, take this all the time. Like, I guess really trying to outline those uh, use contexts and maybe providing a framework for people to understand it in a different way, at least maybe comes off as adding a little bit of responsibility. And, you know, I, I notice that too, sometimes myself needing to kind of have those little caveats um, for safety and, and harm reduction, right? Even though we may understand the nuances a little bit differently, but for a general audience, um, maybe, maybe that's needed. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? I think that like teaching Joe's folks smirking. like how to work <laughs> with these medicines like is actually more important than telling them they need a trip sitter. And I tried to do this in my book, like to teach folks that like maybe you shouldn't go to a really high dose psilocybin, you know, session right away. You should work your way up. You should learn how it feels. You should do it with someone you love and you should start really small. And on subsequent trips, maybe you work your way up if that's your desire to like reach a higher state like that. But that's often left out of the conversation because uh, I don't know why. The fear of the 60s, I think, is Michael Pollan's big thing. He always mentions it. He's like, oh, well, this got out of hand. We don't want to repeat those same mistakes. But I mean, like, is that really what happened? Like, I think that that's kind of overgeneralized as well. And um, it's just like an easy narrative to tell. And I don't really fully buy it. (laughs) It's wholeheartedly ignoring the politicization of the drug war, the racist nature of the drug war, and, and much more. Um, it's, it's, in a way, apologizing for Nixon and Slinger and, and a lot of these other absolutely horrific people that perpetuated the drug war and, and some that still do today. Um, absolutely ignoring it, and it drives me nuts. I don't, <laughs> I don't really know what to do about it other than get angry all the time and yell about it on the internet right but um you know if you're if you're saying this argument oh we got to be safe 22 veteran suicides a day the numbers probably double that honestly um and then you know how we're coming out of this covid thing like people need a little bit of a uh, i don't know a softer approach from the authorities like yes we want to keep people safe why not end the drug war and spend on drug education and actual like spending time researching how to help these people who are suffering and dying in massive numbers. And, you know, to get really dark for a minute, uh, we're going to be seeing a perpetual migrant class based on climate displacement. And people are going to be moving all over the world because they can't be where they are from, from either flooding or high temperatures or no water. We have to really help these people too. It's going to be, what's the number? I think it's one seventh of the world's population in 20 to 40 years will be a, a permanent migrant class um, with no real home. And we've got wow. some work to do. Do we really want to keep locking people up for cocaine um, when we could, you know, be solving real problems here? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on for me in this whole topic and, how dangerous is MDMA? It's about as dangerous as riding a horse. Why do we care so much? LSD and psilocybin, safest drugs ever, according to David Nutt. 
what are we doing? People are still going to jail for this stuff. Um, David Nutt's statement on a conference we had in Exeter was, any drug safer than alcohol should be legal. And let's figure out the rest shortly after that. I think that solves a lot of our problems. <laughs> yeah. Does alcohol come with an instruction book on how to use it? Yeah. I guess it's called, you know, puking at 14 years old, like, and being really not happy with how it felt for a while. Like, I don't really know. Like, no, it doesn't. I know people in their fifties who are still horrible at drinking. <laughs> um, That's hilarious. You know, so I don't know. I get a little bent out of shape on it because the narrative is really specific and it seems to be focused on this medical slash religious model exclusively and i i come from a different world you know i do love this breath work and graphian world but like i live in a somewhat different planet from a lot of these folks i never did recreational cocaine like michael pollan claims to have done in the in his book um like it's kind of a weird scene to me just hanging out doing blow and talking it's like okay now, what about the drug harms from cocaine? Are you worried about the people murdered and trafficking, Michael? No, you're more concerned about safety of white Americans. I get it, but I'm also in you know pretty big disagreement with you often. Well, I'll um, also we have to get Michael on. I need to figure out how to have some drug peace with Michael Pollan. Uh, eventually, I can figure that out. You know, I think that part of what kind of like grates my gears about this argument that. Using psychedelics only, you know, with a sober sitter is harm reduction approach. Like, I don't agree because I think that that perpetuates stigma. And like, if we're telling people that what they're doing is wrong by not using the drugs in this outlined way, then they won't ask for help when they need it because they think they're doing something wrong. And this is the same thing with heroin and cocaine. And, and he even calls those other drugs hard drugs, again, perpetuating stigma against all of these drugs. Like, that's not a harm reduction approach in my mind. That is, that is just like... Uh, you know, this drug exceptionalism elitist kind of attitude that actually isn't helping the actual people using these substances who might run into problems and need assistance. And so that's why I don't think this argument is even like, yeah, that's not a harm reduction approach in my mind. That is just still telling people what you do is wrong and what I do, the educated, wealthy white man is right and you should do what I do. Like, it's just so infuriating to me. Like, it's not really in touch with the drug using or harm reduction community at all. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Any other thoughts, uh, David or Manesh here? <laughs> I can, there's another thing he mentions in the, in the, in the article around uh, the need for a ritual, for a secular, what he called, like, I don't know what his wording was, but he said a secularized kind of ri ritual where we're not appropriating from another culture in, in which we can embed these, these, um, these drugs, I guess, in, in, the, in our context that we're living in. And, and I think... He, he, I mean, something he says is kind of what he implies is that we need a formalized approach that we need to all agree upon and act in relation to, um, or something along these lines. And I think, again, I think, it, I guess it is what Michelle was saying. It's like him being detached from the ground level of what people are actually doing. And you don't need, I don't think, a, a highly complex, elaborate ritual setting, you know, to do these drugs uh, effectively. You just have to follow particular guidelines and be safe and, you know, a secure environment, feel safe, people you trust, the basics. But he, he seems to also imply that we need a, a formalized approach. Otherwise, people are at high risk of, of, of whatever. And again, I think it's just like fear mongering and, you know, extreme. And, and just like, again, just like discrediting people and their ability to do stuff and be, be yeah. fine doing it. Right. And I think well, it's very paternal to think that we need to tell people what to do in these contexts. I might use patronizing. We all think we're yeah. right. <laughs> it's true. That's we why. all think we're right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we need to understand that often we're wrong. And even if we're really, really smart, we could be really, really wrong. Right? Um, hmm. And uh, you can make an argument almost around anything. Um, it's not hard to argue successfully on even crazy points. You know? Um, there's a long tradition of this, you know, um, it's been around for thousands of years, many thousands of years. And 
it's still around today. Uh, you know, lawyers are really good at it, right? And um, yeah, like I, me being told I'm wrong, <laughs> like of course I'm gonna get mad about it um, because I don't think I'm wrong, right? And he's probably gonna be mad that I'm saying he's wrong, or probably doesn't give a shit. More like, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, like well, how do how do we navigate this thing? It's um, it's a weird deal. I think the narr- yeah, we need to allow for plurality of approaches. There's going to be containers that work for some folks and others, you know, not at all. Like if we, Rick Strassman circulated this document critiquing the the Hopkins work, and it was pretty much saying that it's it's a little bit racist the way they're structuring their stuff. They're using a a Buddhist scale. Like, okay, these things are valid because Buddhism or whatever. Like, it's kind of a weak paraphrase, but that was kind of Rick Strassman's argument. And then using kind of German composers, like anti-Semitic composers in psychedelic sessions. Like, of course, that's going to trigger a substantial population in a negative way, especially if those people know the history of that music. And um, there's a lot of short-sightedness in these approaches, and we need to really understand there's going to be a massive plurality of approaches. And maybe recreation is therapeutic. Maybe pleasure is therapeutic. Maybe going to work every day and being well adjusted is actually toxic and giving you cancer. You know, I don't want to go or that OCD far, but addiction. if you're miserable as shit yeah. all the time, <laughs> right, there's going to be some negative consequences from doing miserable shit all the time and like just slapping a band aid on it. Yep, you're good, buddy. Get back in there. Like, it's fucked up. And that, you know, we need to kind of revision how we're doing society a little bit. And I, it's probably a little too radical, you know, for the psychedelic mainstream to hear, but we're driving this ship off the edge. We're th- skating on thin ice all over the world. Um, we're on a spaceship. We should kind of try to treat it like that a little bit more. And, um, you know, there's only a finite amount of room here, folks. Um, Got to figure this thing out. Give people a little bit of leeway. Um, but this, this, that approach, I think the pollen approach is kind of this neoliberal approach of like, let's put everything in a market and it's okay because of capitalism. Um, and that's, it's been okay before capitalism was so dominant. And so it should still be okay. Um, that's my position, uh, for now. Um, I don't want to go into like calling everything sacraments and whatnot because, kind of a goofy phrase for me um but i know some people want to say it's all sacramental so like get your hands off my sacrament (laughs) you know i don't don't really want to go there but you know what is sacramental other than significant Um, or sacred yeah and i want to just add a really small tangent if you don't mind we're talking about kind of societal change and, and policy and being brave around uh, plurality, plur, plurality and uh, kind of trying new things out. And there was this recent um, policy change in Iceland where they took a chunk of the population and said, all right, you lot work a four-day week and we're going to track your life and see what happens in all different ways. And obviously, a lot of people are very afraid of what's going to happen. You know, if, if we only have work a four-day week, you know, we're going to have loss productivity and, uh, you know, it's going to affect the economy and GDP and all that stuff. But actually they found output stay the same. Productivity was not reduced. People were feeling so much happier, great quality life and spending time with family. And so I feel like in a way it's similar because we've got this, this tricky, sticky situation with psychedelics and moving from prohibition and, and, and ending the drug war. And we've got to be brave. We've got to try these things. Ah, that are just a little bit scary to do. Um, and I think we've, we just have to be brave and say, look, we've, we know enough to say uh, we can move forwards now with, with these you know, innovative um, and policies that puts more trust on people, that they can actually handle their life responsibly to work a four-day week and still get the job done. So, uh, <laughs> Saying you want a four-day week, David? Yeah, yeah. 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 This is my uh, third someday. week on the job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's important, right? And I've I've seen that experiment executed on a smaller scale and similar results. You get almost more done in four days than five. It's, it's counterintuitive, but it's worth having these experiments. Um, yeah. And what is healthy? Like, why why do we want to be healthy? 
I don't know. Um, a lot of big questions we should ask ourselves. So, um, kind of want to jump to the next one here. California bill to legalize psychedelic possession advances again. Um, so it seems like there's more progress. Um, but wasn't there a new thing taking away ketamine from this? They, yeah, they took away ketamine, but the, and uh, this new they did a, um, an amendment on uh, limits of personal possession. So um, the committee passed the bill um, with limits uh, imposed. So looks like it would uh, two grams of DMT would be legalized, uh, fifteen grams of ibogaine. Uh, 0.01 grams of LSD, uh, four grams of mescaline, two grams of a controlled substance, uh, psilocybin or four ounces of a, a plant or fungi containing the controlled substance of psilocybin. Um, the same for psilocin and four grams of MDMA. I can carry that all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in one pocket, Joe. <laughs> yeah, right. A big bag. That's fascinating. Yeah. 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 The, the article was interesting because it did allude to uh, what I, th- I guess is a kind of a social media um, discussion uh, between Decriminalized Nature um, and David Bronner. Um, but, you know, in a sense, they're coming from slightly different perspectives, but particularly around, you know, the, the limits that they're setting. And decriminalization, uh, Decriminalized Nature said setting allowable amounts it's just a creative way to say when can law enforcement arrest you so coming from that perspective of you know uh, any limit um in a sense creates this um relationship uh, potentially you know fearing uh, being stopped searched arrested um whereas if there are no limits then uh, it changes the, the whole relationship around them um and then David Bronner in one of his quotes was saying, as always, do we let the perfect be the enemy of the good? And he says, Senator Wine is doing an amazing job for us. And we're able to preserve the essential goal that people can heal in ceremony together and legally produce and consume quantities of the medicine adequate for community-based healing. And there's nothing stopping local city level efforts that have no limiting language whatsoever. So saying he's kind of saying that California, it looks like he's going to support it because um they, they wouldn't have got it through if they tried to not have any limits. But if there's individual cities, for example, Oakland, that's already got pretty advanced um, policy on this, if they wanted to get rid of that limit, then they could do so. Um, so what do I think about that? I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I do want this to pass. I really do. Um, and I think it's, you know, the more states, the more towns that are doing this kind of um, policy, having these kinds of conversations, um, in the echelons of power, being informed by people like David Bronner and decriminalized nature, that can only be good. Um, and yeah, I, I hope this is just one iteration of what will continue to. It's still got a couple more fences to jump over before it's actually passed in California. So let's wait and see what, what might come up next in the, in the next few readings. I mean, I agree that I want this to pass, but another problem with the bill um, in the last a step was that they took away social sharing, right? So that would have been allowed under the bill as introduced. These really? these provisions were also reframed in the new committee amendment. This is from Marijuana Moment to provide for facilitated or supported use so that people could provide the substances to one another, but only in a group context. To me, this reads as David Bronner can make money off psychedelics by producing like a retreat or training programs to keep it in this medical capitalist model instead of like just allowing individuals freedom to share medicine that they grew or, you know, bought or whatever, like, Oh, it actually kind of infuriates me (laughs) because like this is getting quite far away from what the original bill was and getting a bit closer to how people can make money with psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy. Like and it isn't actually going to be about personal freedom or drug users or helping communities of color anymore, like all those great things that uh, Senator Weiner was talking about. And so I don't know, I, I kind of not that I tend to agree with decriminalized nature in general sometimes, but like this, they seem to be kind of right about this. This is getting a little sketchy, I think. 
um, and not cool um, because I think the sharing thing was really important to me. Like, I'm always sharing things with friends <laughs> because they come to me and they think that, you know, I can help. And, and like and, and then and it's illegal and I'm scared to talk about it and all these things. And it's dangerous because of the illegality. And that's not going to change. And we're just going to stay in this old system. And I really don't think um, it's going to benefit the folks that we were really hoping that it would. Yeah, good point, Michelle. I will also say that we're going to have um, a special guest um, come and talk to us about SB 519 in a couple weeks on Solidarity Fridays. Um, they're a really awesome like policy and advocacy advocate. I feel really redundant for saying it like that. Uh, and they're also really involved behind the scenes with SB 519. So we will get some more, just like Manesh is our neuroscience expert, we're going to have like a policy expert come and explain some of the nitty gritty about this um, for, I think it'll be the August 13th episode. So folks should listen up for that one. Yeah. Um, I find that if they've eliminated social sharing and they're pushing towards a group model, um, I get why they're doing it out of an abundance of caution, but I am not as excited about it <laughs> as I was a while ago because before it was straight up, this is legal. Um, you can possess a whole mess of this stuff and you can manufacture it and share it. You just can't sell, right? Amazing um, what that was going to open up. Um, you know, I. I think David Bronner has his hands full. I don't necessarily think he's going to be opening centers, but I know that there's a lot of people looking at Oregon and wishing California would look like Oregon. Um, so, you know, I, whatever it's cool, it's progress. Um, but yeah, it needs to be critiqued. Absolutely. I forcing everything into like a corporate model, I, I think is excessive and not necessarily super helpful. Um, Anybody else want to comment? On I mean, this it doesn't go into jump? detail on how like these these substances will be regulated, right? I mean, just said taking away social sharing. I mean, the, the thing that kind of popped in my head was looking at like a state like Vermont that didn't build in any sort of um, uh, for sale in in their bill, so they don't have any sort of stores that you can buy things in. It was really just kind of based off a of gift economy and maybe how limiting that is to some degree of not being able to go out. For cannabis, yeah, sorry. Um, and not being able to go out and maybe purchase it. It's like grow your own or maybe having to find people to social share um, versus places where, okay, I know where, what I'm getting. I'm going into a store. It's easily accessible versus like, you know, I'm sure it's readily available in a state like that. And you could probably do your networking. But just thinking about people that don't know where to go, right? And they're like, oh, like there's no store to go to. It's like I have to like grow it by myself or I have to, you know, find it through somebody else. Um, and yeah, I don't think they still have uh, stores up. I mean, I think they, they have drafted a bill to get that going. I haven't really been keeping up with it, but um, yeah, it was really kind of just based off a of social sharing gift economy um, for the past few years. Mm. Yeah, and that doesn't really work for everyone, right? Like, yeah, I keep thinking of, like, my mom. <laughs> like, she doesn't know, like, you know, who to ask and all these things. Like, you know, like, she loves her THC oil to help her sleep. And, like, she depends on me to help her source it because I know people and I'm comfortable asking. And, you know, but for most folks, especially, like, boomers and, like, you know, older folks, like, they really need it to be all, like... <sighs> you know, regulated and available and tested. And I don't really believe that mushrooms and psychedelics should be any different. Like even in Pollen's op-ed, he had a line like, oh, hold the phone. We shouldn't have microdoses of mushrooms next to the THC gummies at the dispensary. Like that's to him for some reason, like, but microdoses might be okay. But for some reason, like big doses, you know, that's taking it too far. And like, Without the education for folks, like, sure, you know, we need to teach them how to use this stuff first before they go into a macrodose experience. But, like, I don't know if the gift gather grow model works for folks outside of a drug using community who know who to ask and stuff. Like, for regular people, if we want to help, like, veterans and folks that, you know, are too scared and sketched out to go drug sleuthing, like, it's not actually going to make a difference in their lives. So I'm, I'm on the page where I would just 
not that I want it over commercially commercialized and have billboards and stuff, but I do think it should be available in a safe place. I think we should actually, and this isn't a very American idea, but like have uh, regulations on the advertisement for for drugs if we're going to like decrim or legalize them. Like right now, people are kind of uncomfortable mm. with cannabis billboards and ads and magazines and stuff. And I kind of get it. We took cigarette ads out of magazines and off the TV commercials because like we do like the just marketing as an industry makes things look so much like great and cool and you have to buy it. And so it's like, remember like the Marlboro Man and all those things like we're like, oh, this is actually isn't OK. Like we can't can't be like encouraging teenagers to smoke or like whatever. I think that we just we kind of need something similar if we're going to make this stuff legal. Uh, we need education and we we really don't need the same marketing that we have for other substance or other products. It's like it's different. Like I think what we need more is like, yeah, more education in schools for kids, for everybody, uh, instead of just letting it be like a free for all, you know, billboards of MDMA. And like that also scares me. Right. But uh, I don't know. It's it's complicated. But I do think that that could help. The fact that we're the only country, I think, in the world allowing pharmaceutical advertisement, um, just there's like one other something we should really look at. Yeah. Okay, that's ridiculous. We're the biggest. Yeah, Manesh, and richest. you guys don't have uh, pharmaceutical ads on TV, right? Uh, I don't think so. Not on Canadian channels. I think if we look at a at an American channel, I feel like we do see them, but like. You know, half the commercial or whatever is them listing the side effects. You know, yeah. I'm not sure if yeah. you guys, but I do have memory of seeing that. I don't watch TV very often. I never do anymore, but I remember seeing uh, in the past something like that. You know, it's funny you say that, like, because, yeah, maybe, David, you had this experience when you moved to America. But when my partner is from a very similar region of England that you are, when he was staying at my house in New York, and I think my grandma was yeah. watching, you know, daytime TV, like game shows. And there's so many commercials because it's all old people at that time watching TV for pharmaceuticals like blood pressure drugs or drugs to take because your blood pressure drugs causes the side effects. So now you need all these other drugs to help you like live a happy life. And it's like he could not believe it. It blew his mind. He's like, how is this ethical? Like, this is not OK. Like you can't. And to, especially to vulnerable old people, like it's kind of horrible. And so. Like, I think that America really needs to reevaluate mm -hmm. how it markets all drugs, pharmaceuticals included. And then maybe we'd be ready to legalize other drugs as well. <laughs> yeah, I think looking at advertising as manipulating consciousness and trying to extract as much money from them as, as possible. When I came to America nine years ago, yeah, that. I think that was before Netflix, perhaps before we had Netflix. So yeah, I had to watch adverts and I just hated it. I, I like nowadays, I literally hardly ever watch uh, adverts because I just, I can select what I want on Netflix and just kind of totally avoid all, all adverts. And, but the funny thing is in America, you, you down the street or the highway, there's just so many billboards and it's, you know, on subway cars, there's just adverts anywhere and everywhere. And so when we're looking at, mm. you know, our consciousness and our ability to feel content <laughs> and to be at peace and just to go into our own imaginations, um, yeah, th this country particularly makes it really hard to form deep relationships with ourselves and have an ongoing dialogue of, uh, yeah, identifying and following our intuition. So it makes these kinds of drug policy conversations which are very complex harder to to formulate an answer around and you know coming from europe uh, each country in europe has nuanced policies around uh, you know drugs and, and reform and i'm sensing in 10 years when we look back we'll see a, a similar patchwork of drug policies in the states of america and and that may enable us to do some kind of uh, you know uh, cross-sectional uh, research and sensing uh, what policies led to what kinds of outcomes and, you know, just as we've got Colorado that embraced uh, cannabis um, recreational use, you know, before the others, that gives us a bit of data to, to see what happens. Um, so I think there's going to be a patchwork in what we're seeing. California is maybe going in this direction, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, I think the more states that start to 
put these kinds of measures into place, we're kind of learning from each other, aren't we? Oh, they did it that way. So we'll take a bit of that model and a bit of that state's model, and then we want to do it this way. Um, and hopefully after a few versions of this process, we'll find something that federally works. But uh, I do think it's more going to be on the state level that we're really going to see the evolution and the brave kind of policy making that's going to save the most lives and give people the most healing that we need. Mm. <clears throat> so next up, and this will be the last one probably, but Vice did an article about the rise in DMT, DMT vaping, and um, just kind of midday, somewhat regular use. Like um, casual DMT admit, smoking, right? Right here on the air. Yeah, right. <laughs> casual DMT use. Yeah. So my first time smoking DMT was at a concert. Like, I'll, I'll be honest Ugh, about it. It's kind of an awkward thing to say on, on radio, <laughs> right? But why? It was available and I was uh, primed with other substances, I guess. Um, that's probably the why. Did you break through at the <laughs> so concert? So it was not a pure... No, 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 no. There was no intention of doing that whatsoever. Um, yeah, I, I was just like, okay, let's try just a little bit, see what the deal is. And I, yeah, you know, breaking through it seems like a ridiculous idea. I think a lot of the vape carts make it kind of a, a little difficult to do that. But why is it a ridiculous in the effort, idea? You can do it. Um, some of them are really low quality too. Um, well, you can fall down, get hurt, dissociate in the middle of a crowd. Oh, yeah. Um, in public? I just don't yeah. think uh, concerts are the right venue for it. I have the same critiques about it um, with ketamine, like ketamine use in a recreational setting. People go overboard too far and fall down and can't get up and are a danger to themselves and others. Same thing, with, in my opinion, with DMT in a public setting. Hmm. But I'm not going to be like, don't do it. Like, I, I think it's a bad idea, but I don't want laws preventing people from doing it um but the article is a little goofy i, I don't know I, michelle what did you think of this article <laughs> yeah i think it was a little corny uh as well but i mean it is kind of interesting like there are some stats like i don't have the exact numbers in front of me but it was like only two percent of the population had used dmt in like 2016 and now it's closer to like four or five percent so it is rising you know with the media attention and everything um it is a really short experience too like that was kind of an argument with folks with these overwhelmed google calendars which i can relate to like how are you going to actually find time to take lsd or psilocybin and like take the day off after and yada yada it's like just really hard to find that kind of time you know we have a lot of obligations going on and and DMT is really like it's so quick. I mean, 30 minutes later, I'm like downstairs making supper after breaking through. It's like really not a big deal. Um, I don't know. Like, yeah, I agree that like breaking through publicly is like not a good idea. Just like K-holing in public. Like if something where you can't move your body like that's dangerous, especially as a woman. Like, you know, I don't want my you know, to not be all there in public, like what's going to happen to my body? Like, it's terrifying. But I will say mm -hmm. that microdoses of DMT and ketamine are kind of fun in social situations. They are like alcohol. They are, you know, kind of social lubricants. Um, are we willing to start talking about this and, and, and normalize it and teach people about safe dosing for parties and stuff? Like... I don't know. Um, these DMT vape pens are, I've never actually had one. Um, they're interesting. People tell me about, yeah, going out to like raves more than like concerts, uh, you know, where it's a bigger population on, you know, MDMA and acid and stuff. Uh, and they're not breaking through. They're not, they're, they're consciously not, you know, going that deep. Um, but let's talk. I mean, I also think that there's a lot of benefit and it's really fun and interesting to, you know, smoke DMT a full dose and see what happens when you're in a safe. Like I usually do it in my bedroom with really low lighting and um, it's really, really fascinating. <laughs> it's really far out and different than anything I've ever experienced. And I think there's like a lot of value as a highly like creative person in that world. Um, especially as like an alien buff, I'm like actually really trying to meet aliens, but, um, I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> Putting in the legwork. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I don't know. 
I think that the, in a way it was corny, but in a way it's kind of edgy, right? It's making everyone, I think, right here a little uncomfortable, just what I'm saying. And so that's kind of interesting to me. <laughs> and uh, like, you know, let's talk about smoking DMT. Like it's quite different, the extract than 5-MeO <laughs> and like, I don't know, like, what are we all feeling here? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I love it. I, I think it's a really interesting idea, but let's hear from it, somebody else before I jump back in. <laughs> so I, I haven't uh, experienced DMT. It it looks fantastically, incredibly scary and amazing. And the concept of breaking through, I guess I hadn't come across that before. Is it almost, how would you define that? First of all, if, that, if someone could give that a sense, is that kind of like astral travel or leaving your body and no, kind of consciousness somehow certain... drifting into spaces where you... No quite like that's like yeah no you're you're going too far actually like with dmt extract like if you don't take enough you just kind of get into this like kind of interesting space and that's like the might like what the vape pens do you're not quite tripping sometimes things get a little fractally but breaking through is different like you kind of get this like whooshing sound and then like you're in this pretty far out space for like five minutes. I'm always still quite aware that I'm in my bedroom and then I'm me um, looking, closing. But when I close my eyes, it's like really kind of beautiful and wild and different than I've ever seen anything before. I get these kind of like 80s video game like visuals um and that's just me that's like not normal i don't think <laughs> and like and and then it's over and then as soon as you realize what's going on you're like oh i'm coming down and like you're already coming back to the world and i've gotten like really euphoric experiences i've met like one entity that was really <laughs> kind of interesting and weird but like there is a difference, like a microdose and breaking through. Like, yeah, like I smoked DMT a bunch of times before I broke through because I worked up to it. I did like small doses and finally I I got up to a breakthrough dose and uh, it is quite different. And um, but it's not that scary. It's not like salvia. I think a lot of people compare it to salvia. That's definitely scarier. Um, it's kind of beautiful. I don't know. I don't really think there's that much to be afraid of personally. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen a person have a bad experience on DMT. I've seen a lot of people have experiences on DMT and I, I don't have. understand what that is. You have, can you share that story, Kyle? Briefly? Um, rough sketch. Yeah. Just, just somebody screaming to the top of their lungs that they were dying That's... and to call nine one one. Um, and absolutely terrified <clears throat> that they were dead. Mm -hmm. That's pretty common right. to think you're dying. I remember you sharing that in class a few times. But I think that there are skills to yeah. learn how to handle that on other psychedelics. Like it's pretty like once you get kind of like, you know, seasoned and you learn how to trip well, then you know that you're not actually dying. Like I think that that's just like the come up on mushrooms. I think a lot of folks think they're dying. But once they do it a couple of times, they realize that this is just part of their come up. And it's like they're not dying. They're fine. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like. I think that you can kind of learn how to navigate that situation. I've, I've mm. got one other point I wanted to make and, and, and Manish, I wanted to ask you after this point, just to share your thoughts of what, what, what's DMT from like a neurological neuropsych piece and just your personal beliefs as well, like what happens with this breakthrough experience. But, but the one thing I wanted to jump in and say is the article was talking about a lot of people using this um, DMT pen because it's quick and easy and they, they just need something quick to deal with stress. It's almost like popping like a Xanax pill, like to stop a panic attack or like, I'm just sick of my job. <laughs> I want to get out of here. And maybe they need a four day week. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's speaking to that real, uh, people don't have the skills or the tools and they're, they, they, they're kind of, some people are just looking for something to escape momentarily that might help them to, come back into their real life and feel like a little bit more um yeah like it, it, they, they're going to be okay with it it's like mm -hmm. a perspective shifter yeah uh, yeah it's... but please manage <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no i totally agree i think i think people just want to be shaken out of their current headspace and their current way of of um yeah of perceiving themselves in their current situation whether it's that day or or week or whatever and just 
you know, break out of it with the hope of coming back uh, slightly differently. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think it's very reasonable. And I, I mean, if I want to bring it to the neuroscience, the DMT, you know, does increase neuroplasticity as well, very importantly, because um, it activates the serotonin two A receptor as well. And so you do get this boost of neuroplasticity. I'm sure even at the vape levels, it probably is less, but it would still have an effect if you're having subjective effects. Then for sure, you're still getting activation. So you're giving yourself a little boost in neuroplasticity with that. And, um, and yeah, like for me, like. For example, I'm a big meditator. I've been meditating, you know, every day since I was like 18 or something. And it's a big part of my life and just approach to life. And I find if I'm in a weird headspace or I'm off, I'll just go and just sit and be in silence and, you know, meditate on, on my breath or just, you know, present moment awareness for 20 minutes or whatever. And I come out of it and I feel much more grounded. I feel kind of reset. Most people, you know, can't, don't have the background to do that because it's not easy to get to that point. You, to, you know, it takes a lot of dedicated practice. And so something like DMT is obviously, you know, uh, enticing for them because they could just smoke this thing uh, and then just like kind of be gone out of their usual way of thinking for a bit and come back. Um, so in that sense, it, it makes sense. Um, but yeah, at the same time, we shouldn't need to be dependent on something for something like that, right? Like, I mean, first of all, there's preventative measures to prevent yourself from burning out in that way where you feel like you need an escape. Um, that might sound, you know, very idealistic to some perhaps, but it doesn't need to be. And I don't see it as idealistic. I think, you know, it's, pers it's, it's, on, it's a person's ability to become, to live their life in a way such that it's not totally draining on them. And it's often a matter of the orientation towards their life and how much they're resisting what's happening, how much they expend unnecessary energy, ruminating, ruminating, worrying. And there's so many things that can be done to make us feel grounded and stable and efficient with our energy throughout the day, such that these things aren't even needed. Um, so I think, although it could be effective in these contexts, I think it's better just to train people better ways to navigate their life and a way to, the ways to calm their mind and refresh themselves. So it's even though you know, DMT is not necessarily, it, well, it's not physiologically or physically addictive. Uh, I think it could be psychologically addictive, especially it's relieving yourself of something that's negative and you will want to want that escape and become reliant on it. And I think there is a trap if you're, if you're doing it, you know, it's so soon it'll become a habit. It's like, oh, it's 5 p.m. 5 p.m. I need to switch into out of work time. I'm going to smoke some DMT. And you do it every day and then, you know, that's how it builds. And you can see uh, that happening. It's yeah. almost, it's crazy, but it's like, it's like anything else. If it's relieving yourself of a negative experience, there's potential for psychological dependence on it. Um, and I think that's where the worry is. Um, but yeah, but it'll be very interesting if there was like a clinical trial using these kind of low doses and seeing if it was effective. I would imagine, yes, it, it would be similar to ketamine perhaps in having some uh, short-term boosts. Uh, or short-term reductions in depression uh, symptoms or anxiety, for example, um, and can be maybe embedded within a holistic treatment plan or something effectively in the future. I do see the possibility for that too. Totally. I'm really interested in um, vaped microdose DMT for CTE and various brain traumas. I think that could be a really fascinating set of research to look into. Um, 5-MeO as well. I don't, I don't know the difference between their, their action really at that level, but people should be looking at that, please. I, I bet Daniel Carcillo is. Um, yeah. So I know somebody that smokes, will get really drunk and then just smoke DMT at home for hours. I know other people who will use it once every nine months. Yeah. That's kind of um, where I'm at. And <laughs> it makes, it makes them feel like, you know, healthy again. It's kind of, you know, that it, it's kind of awkward and overused, but it's, it's that, that they use the term, the, you know, brain reset. I'm like okay, great. You're you're able to sleep well again for a few weeks. That's amazing, and you felt in a positive mood for a few weeks. Great. Like of course that's not a big deal. You know if if you can handle the you know the extreme nature of the experience, probably not that big of a deal. But if you're at risk, like there's a lot of people who aren't able to really handle a big DMT experience. Nor should they. They need a lot of time and therapy. Probably getting their diet, exercise, gut biome right first lifestyle right first and then adding these kind of more extreme things on but other people you know will need these extreme experiences to be able to get the rest of it right you need to get a little shooken up and shaken up first before you can really make these changes um yeah cool anything else on this weird dmt topic i just wonder um I think this came from Dennis McKenna he might have wrote about this in the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss but just talked about how 
maybe it was on a podcast somewhere, but just talking about how the novelty wore off over time. Like at mm-hmm. first with DMT, it was like this carnival, you know, it was so active, so many lights, the rides are like the, the amusement park is totally full. Um, and then over the years, how that diminished, like, you know, the lights weren't as fancy, the rides weren't like moving, um, and the amusement park was pretty empty. So I always wonder too, if, um, it, some of those transpersonal qualities diminish over time if you overuse it. Our gentleman who the first ever confessions of an underground therapist, he talked about how it's pretty easy for our minds to wrap themselves around a drug after a few exposures. Um, I, th- I feel that way about most of them. I was going to say, like, we could say um, that about. And, yeah, it's an interesting all thing. Of them. Yeah, like mushrooms, LSD, and to a degree, right? Like, he was generalizing. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing. Like, um, but Dennis McKenna, now he's really committed to the ayahuasca world. Um, he's drank it countless times, and uh, you know what does that mean? And, you know, I, I like Matt Palomari. He was always saying, like, it's, it's roughly the same experience, except one's four minutes and the other one's hours. Um, and you probably get a lot more benefit from the one that lasts hours. Um, if you're looking for benefit, if you're looking for a good time, it's, you know, whatever. Or aliens. Kyle, one thing that keeps coming up for me <laughs> is this. Um, do you remember talking to Lenny about the Eleusinian mysteries and, and how a few people we're able to, you know, sneak the the Kikion out of um, the ritualistic setting, and we're doing it in their living rooms and whatnot. It's uh, called the profaning of the mysteries, um, and it was so. like a pretty severe sentence if you got busted, that kind of yeah. thing, right? Well, I mean, you um, couldn't even, even really talk Roman about times. it. Right, uh, it's like punishable by death. So yeah, sneaking the the concoction out. Yeah, I'm sure that's pretty heavy. Right, and <laughs> in a lot of ways. I think this is what we're seeing and a lot of people are really uncomfortable with it. And I get it. If it's the thing that's most sacred to you in the world and people are, you know, doing it in all sorts of crazy and relatively profane situations, of course you're going to have a reaction um, and be a little upset about it. Um, But, you know, (laughs) let's couch our uh, discernment in an appropriate context, given our world situation. Um, is it better to put these people in jail for 40 years, you know, or put Ross all, sorry, I, we haven't even got into this yet. Um, the whole free Ross movement that I'm loving right now. Um, he's in jail for a double life sentence for making a website. <laughs> like unbelievable. Um, there's rapists that get out in two years. So it's like, what are we, what are we doing? Hmm. Um, anyway, the profaning of the mysteries being a recurring pattern um, that I think we should reflect on here and there. and. Are, what are what's your vision of where you want culture to go and are your decisions and responses to these types of things um, appropriately in alignment with where you want to see culture go? Um, are you perpetuating more harm? Are you perpetuating more care for people and development and a healthier culture? Um, yeah, so food for thought. Um, cool. Uh, I guess we're good to wrap, y'all. Yeah um yeah we're a little over time cool uh closing thoughts from anybody manesh you want to say your website or youtube or anything yeah sure because you mentioned it (laughs) so uh yeah i do have my youtube channel uh the psychedelic scientist and it's basically what i made to to share this whole world of psychedelic science with my friends and family and just also to fill a void where i perceive that you know as you guys i'm sure would agree a lot of the news um articles around psychedelics are sensationalist or or very superficial or like, you know, not really close to what the science is actually telling us. So I want to wanted to provide an e- a platform um, where people can understand these things like lay people, people who don't know the science and don't have a scientific background, who can actually understand these things at a deeper level of nuance and, and detail than is usually uh, made available to them. And so yeah, this is why I made my channel. Uh, so the psychedelic scientist on YouTube, um, and also on Instagram. Amazing. Mm-hmm. It's a great channel. Um, I'm a great. big fan. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, really appreciate you joining us and hope we can do more of it. Um, for sure. Yeah, so, all right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. It's been really fun. Um, covered a lot of ground, <laughs> and, uh, maybe in weird directions, um, but I think all important things. Um, so 
If y'all want to help us out, <laughs> leave us a review on iTunes, Facebook, Google, wherever you're on your phone. Please leave us a review. We'd love it. It helps us a lot. Uh, you can leave a small monthly donation over at Patreon, patreon.com slash psychedelics today. Or check out our classes. July 22, we have an amazing course coming up, Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists. Kyle and I um, have been teaching this for years now. We're hoping David will join us. And um, it's going to be an incredible group. So people from all over the world joining, you get to hear about drug policy all over. You get to have a really interesting foundation to help you navigate your future in this psychedelic space. And it's open to more than just clinicians and therapists. So please come on down, check it out and um, hope to see you there. Psychedelicstoday.com and psychedeliceducationcenter.com. All right, everybody. This is um, a <laughs> whole Psychedelics Today team. And Anish Kern. Thank you all for <laughs> tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode. Take care. See you, everybody.